So the United Kingdom has spent the past four days honouring the 70-year reign of Her Majesty the Queen. People up and down the country and across the world have been lauding Queen Elizabeth's services to Britain and to the Commonwealth, her leadership through good times and bad. But what is often overlooked is the practical and immersive role of the monarchy within our political system. We all see events such as the state opening of Parliament and new Prime Ministers visiting Buckingham Palace to ask to form a government after a general election. But what are the powers, duties and obligations of the constitutional monarchy within our parliamentary democracy? Delighted to say I'm joined now in the studio and he's going to tell us all about the Queen's place in our democracy is lecturer in constitutional law at the University of Bristol, Dr Robert Craig. Robert, thank you so much uh, for joining me today of all days to talk about the constitutional monarchy. Just explain for our listeners and our viewers, what is a constitutional monarchy? Oh, well, constitutional monarchy is, um, well, we have, we have uh, the paradigm example of a constitutional monarchy, which is a parliamentary democracy with a titular head, uh, a head of the state who actually has no actual political or powers in the, in the actual system. And that kind of balance is unusual, um, to say the least. And it's, to a certain extent, one of the most British things about this country, isn't it? The fact that we have this kind of unusual system. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, we hear sometimes royal prerogative being spoken about. What is the royal prerogative? The royal prerogative is a residue of the legal powers that originally possessed by the monarch throughout history. Mm. And what's happened over the years, as we've got democratic, is that those powers have been effectively taken over by the elected government, as it should be in a democracy. But what's beautiful about it is that officially the Queen exercises mm. all these powers, but in reality, the Prime Minister exercises these powers. Yeah. And, and, that, and that dichotomy is it's the, almost designed to confuse the Americans, as far <laughs> as I can tell. Um, it's, it's the, it's the, 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 the form and the substance are completely separate. So Walter Badgett, 150 years ago, identified mm. two sides of the Constitution, the dignified and the efficient side. So the dignified part is represented by the Queen. Yeah. So she does all the formalities. But the efficient part is the democratically elected and accountable part. And that balance, that kind of duality, epitomises our system. And I, I was reading somebody you will know very well, Vernon Bogdanor in The Telegraph today. I saw that. And he said, we've moved from the magical monarchy to a public service monarchy just during that period of time. Because actually, when Elizabeth was crowned um, uh, 69 years ago, actually, mm. just this weekend... Mm. Some people actually did believe in divine rights at that time, didn't they? Well, perhaps. I mean, the, the, <laughs> I, I'm not going to parse the, 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 the views of, of the population 70 years, years ago, but, but I think there's always been a public service element to the monarchy, mm. hasn't there? I mean, mm. Queen Victoria was, 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 was renowned for the fact that, she, well, that there, there was a sort of sense of duty, and that duty and that was passed down to Queen Mary, the grandmother of the Queen, who she frequently cites as being the inspiration for her public service. So I think there's always been a, a strong tradition of duty and honour and, and public service in, in the monarchy. But I think uh, it has changed over those 70 years, let's be honest about it. But I think, for me, the magic, if I'm going to use that word, is the fact that she does it so seamlessly. So actually she adapts to everything that's happening in the nation, but she does it in a way that doesn't cause offence and it's still very traditional. Well, that's that's a skill and we're very lucky to have had someone who's who's been not just very well advised, but has got good judgment. Yeah. And, and, you know, we can't guarantee that we're going to have that indefinitely. I mean, we, we can look back in history and see monarchs and, and prince regents, perhaps, who yeah. are, have not perhaps lived up to, the, to that standard. But we can only hope that, that, that she's set such an example that the, we'll set that up for, the future, for future monarchs, we can hope. But I, I think this weekend, again, for me, also showed the continuity of the monarchy as well, because people talk about, and we've seen uh, some of the, the Republicans in the country talking about make Elizabeth the last and all of this sort of offensive talk. But actually what you're seeing on display is the handing over of the baton in a very seamless way, I think. That's an interesting point. Um, I, I haven't seen these ideas that make Elizabeth the last Monarch, I don't think that. I don't think there's any any no. appetite no. for that in the country no, it's whatsoever. Just, it's just the Republican oh, well, organisation well, saying that. I, I, it's interesting to to watch Republican um, commentary uh, at the moment, which has been quite muted mm. as far as I can tell. Because um, I, for me, a lot of there is arguments and constitutional theory on this, but we have a republic already, really, mm. in, in the sense that the the, the, the functioning of the system yes. is entirely done by democratic means, mm. and I think we lose something. 
if we if we get rid of the monarchy, if we were to get rid of the monarchy, we'd lose we'd lose that that dichotomy I was mentioning earlier, yeah. that 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 sort of surface level and that sort of re- reality, which is so British. It's polite. We don't necessarily always say exactly what is meant. We know this from British, and it's exactly the same that feeds through like, all the way through our system and all the way through the constitution, right to the top. So that the the idea that the, that the monarchy has some power is is just wrong, mm-hmm. and the idea that they are that they are running the country is also wrong. But it looks like that from the outside because the royal prerogative powers that we already mentioned are significant. They, they include making treaties, they include appointing a prime minister, proroguing parliament, dissolving parliament, summoning parliament. These powers are immensely important, but they're not held by the Queen anymore. Yeah. So that, once you look at the reality, you can see that actually the, 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 what would, it becomes a symbolic question. Well, we symbolically don't want to have a monarchy at the top, but, but that's actually to miss the whole point. That's my problem with the idea, is that it misses the reality and the structure of how the system actually works. Yeah, and, and I was challenged uh, by somebody from the Republic of Ireland at the weekend that everybody is uh, wants democracy. But as you rightly say, we have democracy in this country. What the Queen does and what the royal family does is actually give us that continuity, reflecting back on ourselves, a sense of Britishness. I mean, people from all political parties are out celebrating over the weekend. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't matter who you support politically, but she actually is able to bring everybody together. And she stands above politics. That's one of the most important principles, but possibly one of the central principles of our political discourse is that the Queen doesn't get dragged into any kind of yeah. actual political dispute. And that is really important and needs to be continued. But the other factor about, about the Constitution is its flexibility. Mm. And it's that flexibility with that st- stable kind of carapace over the top mm. that allows for real change to happen. So that's why, that's why it actually ironically gives you more opportunity to have a flexible, adaptable system we don't know what pe- people in 100 years' time are going to want to do and how, where they want to run their mm. country. But there's more chance, I would suggest, in a flexible constitution with a monarchy that has no real power over the top for real change to occur and to be permitted to happen politically because of that stability over the top. Yeah. What we don't want to do, in my view, is codify the system, make it... Uh, not even the Victorians codified the constitution. I mean, that's how arrogant it is to think that we know now how we should run the system indefinitely for all future generations. Absolutely. Whereas the Victorians, who built an empire, yeah. didn't... Thing. They, they understood the value of the flexibility of the system. They knew that future generations would have their own opinions, their own choices, how they want to run the country democratically. And that is actually more achievable, in my view, if you continue to have an entirely honorific monarchy, a constitutional monarchy, which has no actual powers over the, uh, overlaid over the top mm. that allows for people to, rep- to, to choose the people who represent them in the parliament and get done what they want to get done, in my view. Yeah. I think, Paul, uh, you have a question that you wanted to ask as well. Yeah, hi, Robert. Um, if, the, if the powers through the royal prerogative are exercised by the, the prime minister of the day, I mean, I just wonder, is it the case then that effectively the monarch has no power at all and and her role is nothing more than a a kind of ceremonial one, really? And if if that is the case, then constitutionally, what would we lose by having, for example, an elected head of state? There you go. That's our mild Republican aspect. (laughs) Yes, there's some more Republicanism in there. Well, I think the first question is, what do we gain? Yes. Chesterton's fence says that if you want to change something, you've got to explain what a good reason why we have it and then justify removing that. Yes. And we know that there are very good reasons to have it and there are no actual political powers. Now, when I say zero political powers, you can construct some fanciful scenarios mm. where where there may be... A, this happened in 2010, when the, the yes. Gus O'Donnell was worried that there might be a hung parliament we didn't know who was going to be prime minister. Mm. And it was made crystal clear by the palace they weren't going to do anything until the parliament had decided who to send to the yeah. palace. So yeah. that, that's exactly how it, how it should be. So in terms of um, what you lose, you lose something. As I mentioned before, you lose that, that dichotomy, that special nature of the British constitution that is so British, is that you say, how is that? Mm, quite good doesn't mean quite good. That means it's not very good. Yes, there's, there's, there's a duality. There's a, there's, a, there's a politeness, there's a front, and then there's a reality. You lose that. And what do you gain? Yeah. Paul, what? did you want to come back on that? Well, I was just going to say, I think there's also another example in the 1970s where Gough Whitlam, the, the Labour Prime Minister, uh, I think was, was removed from power by the, the um, Governor General uh, on behalf of the monarch. So there was a real life example of an elected Prime Minister. And there were all sorts of controversies going on at the time in Australia, it's fair to say, within the Australian government. But that was an example of where that power was exercised. And I guess the argument would be, Robert, look, if you've got a president doing that, at least he or she has a democratic 
explicit mandate to do that. Whereas when a monarch does it, it's kind of the monarch making the decision or probably more realistically, the unaccountable advisors of the monarch making that kind of controversial decision. That's a bit harder to defend, do you not think? I absolutely agree, which is why I'm one of the people who suggests that if there are any residual and you have to construct some pretty fanciful scenarios for this yeah. to happen, those should be dealt with. Yeah. In other words, we should remove the possibility of the monarch being able to do any of these things. So a common example is actually dissolution of parliament. So people say, oh, well, there could be a situation where there's an election and the prime minister um, doesn't think they can have another go straight away, and, but, there, but there's an alternative government that could be formed, the opposition could have the Lib Dems join. And they create these scenarios. Yeah. And they go, oh, and therefore the Queen, in these weird circumstances, should be able to say no. And I'm one of the few people who go, no. Have the next election. They'll be punished in the ballot box. Yeah. Take the Queen out of all of these situations in all possible circumstances and make it clear that they were never going to get involved to avoid the Gough Whitlam situation. So, so I'm absolutely in favour of removing any residual elements. And there's, one, there's only one left, really, that's actually... And even this one's not that big a problem, really, which is the weekly meeting. How much would the Tesco chief executive pay for an hour to lobby the Prime Minister? <laughs> yeah, a lot. How many... Once a week... So that's the only one. But even that one's totally in private. Yeah. And it's never published. But that one's the only one where I'm like, that's not, not, I've got a slight issue with that one, right? But the, but the, but the, the, the theme of my, my argument is the Queen's residual points must be, must be removed precisely to avoid the Gough Whitlam situation. Yeah. The beauty of that was that the Governor General could, could, be, could leave, could be fired. We can't fire the Queen. We can't fire the King. So that, yeah. that needs to be removed. So remove these residual elements and make it completely dignified. Oh, no, Robert, I think uh, our prime ministers do value that time with the monarch. So they say, anyway, listen, I'm sorry we're going to have to leave it there. I could talk about this all day, so as can you I. can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming into the studio today.